great pleasure in introducing Mike Moore, who many of you will know. And Mike has been collecting butterflies for 50 years, he tells me, um, from um, a ripe old age of 22 right through the present day. And uh, particularly uh, Marion stimulated his interest in butterflies. And so it's a wonderful partnership. Mike taught biology and chemistry at school for 37 years, uh, mostly high school, high school. And uh, for the last 10 years, he's been an honorary associate at the South Australian Museum, spends a lot of time working on rain moths, their genetic diversity. And um, just recently, Mike and Marion had a wonderful trip to Costa Rica, which is a, you know, an amazing Central American place. And um, he said that whilst he doesn't actually have favourites, apart from Marion, his, one of his outstanding birds in Costa Rica was the barred ant shrike. And one of the reasons for that is Australia doesn't have any barred birds apart from uh, the footballers, magpies. Um, but certainly it's unusual uh, that we don't have any. So without further ado, thank you, Mike, and um, over to you. Thank you. Um, what we've been trying to do here for the last year and a bit is to um, make it feel as though you, the audience, can be butterfly collectors, if that's what you desire. Or at least you can, um, you can go into the field and get some enjoyment of of seeing things and seeing different things, et cetera, okay? And that's why we've sort of changed that structure a little bit this year. And I know, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you, but I know that some of you have been wanting perhaps a more practical demonstration of butterfly collecting. And that's really what I've put together today, I hope. And at the end of it, I'm sort of going to offer you, or um, yes, offer you a little challenge. And that is to see if you can do some of these things in the next butterfly season. Okay. Um, I sort of, ever since I was a kid, I've been interested in natural history. And um, for the first few years of our marriage, I was saying to Marion, oh, you know, I'm, we were already doing quite a bit of bird watching and botany by then. But I said, I said to her, look, um, I'm, I'm, you know, why don't we go and collect some butterflies? But I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go to get any equipment. Fortunately, we were lucky enough then to meet Robert Fisher, who is historically one of the state's um, biggest and most uh, renowned butterfly collectors. And he actually told me that you can buy things in Australia. I know that seems a bit strange, but this was the sort of um, uh, late, no, early 70s. So anyway. Um, uh, and um, that sort of, Marion took the bull by the horns and she said, I'm going to buy you some men. For Christmas and she did that and in a sense we haven't ever looked back in some ways anyway so how do you go bird or uh, butterfly collecting that's if collecting is what you want to do and that is going to be part of our chat tonight okay now those people on the screen uh, on the on zoom I'm going to have to apologize a little in advance because I'll be doing a little bit of play acting at times and you, you won't see that. But um, I'll try to elevate it as much as my small stature um, allows me. Actually, that was one of the things I really enjoyed about Costa Rica. It, most people there are about my height. It was, it was entirely enjoyable for that. Okay, so you wanna go butterfly collecting. Well, You sort of need a net. You can collect butterflies without a net, by the way. Um, we've done that. In, if you know where to go and how they behave, you can catch them in jars and things like that. 
But so you're going to need a net. Um, you're going to need, at the minimum, some jars. Now, you'll notice that uh, I'm true brew Australian here, so we all know what these jars are. And you'll need a bag to put the jars in. So now, when we first started, I actually used the shoulder bag, and I used that for years. Um, uh, but I actually think these are probably better because they're less cumbersome. So, right, you've got your jars in your bag. You put your bag on your back. You grab your net. And away you go. And I'd like to thank you all. And uh, are there any questions? <laughs> It was so easy in the beginning, okay? Um, as soon as you start collecting a few, um, you realise there are a few other problems. But unfortunately, it's, it's devolved, evolved from this to this. You know, you're carrying boxes around. And it's even worse if you're a moth collector because inevitably you need a generator and a light and, you know, your box number's up to three or four and you need some petrol and oil and it, it just, anyway. But it's all fun, okay? Even when you get old, it's fun. Um, you know, that thrill of the chase, really is something, okay? I remember many years ago, there was an advert with, I, I don't know whether it's, I think it was created by John Hawkins. And he, and he made some very derogatory uh, aspirations or directions towards butterfly collecting. And that made me sit down and think, oh, why do people think that butterfly collecting is something a bit weird? It's not, it, it contains all of the human passions, okay? It's academic. It's, you're dealing with beautiful objects. I mean, even the plainest butterflies and moths, if you look, if you're lucky enough to be able to look deeply at their pattern, you'll see some wonderful things in there. And of course, as we said before, the thrill of the chase, the thrill of the heart. Okay, all right, so let's just, I'm just going to get my talk up here and um, then you'll be able to uh, share a little bit more of what I'm doing and where we're going. We're going to talk about two or three things today uh, with regards to collecting. The first thing we're going to talk about is equipment. So we're going to talk a little bit about nets. Field work and techniques, yes. Oh, right. Let's early. move on. Yes, there we go. What are we going to talk about? Collecting equipment, field storage, very important, raising specimens at home, and plants. Okay, and we're going to start with collecting. So that's what we're going to talk about. But first, we have to address this which is, of course, the elephant in the room. Because, in a sense, collecting has become not quite a dirty word, certainly not in Australia, but in parts of the world. If you say you go out and collect almost anything, um, apart from perhaps antiques, you're, you know, people look at you uh, slightly askance. And I think that scrutiny is probably good. But I do want to discuss very briefly, and I, I hope I'm not going to put some of you off by dealing with this first, okay? So I've got a little section here, pros, cons of collecting, and then what I call the zeros, things that probably we need to think about, but it's not, neither of those. Okay, firstly, um, we all know that our planet's in a... In, in a pretty parlous state. And that really 
it behoves all of us to be as educated um, and talkative about the natural world. If you don't know much about it, you could easily get left out. What worries me about what we might see in the next few years is that there are so many people in our society that haven't got an understanding of the natural world that they won't appreciate what's going to be lost. I mean, we're on a planet here which has probably got 10 million species on it. I mean, how many species do we really need to make humans survive? Probably a fraction of that but we're gonna lose all that richness and beauty. So I think that's important about collecting. And the one thing about a collection is of course, that people can come and have a look. And if somebody can talk about that collection, there'll always be something interesting. Something interesting about life cycles, or something interesting about um, appearance. There's so much diversity on the planet. Everybody is going to be uh, enthralled. So being interested, okay, very important. I can remember as a young, young boy going to the South Australian Muse Museum and then they had butterfly collections in the, in the main building. And I can remember going there and enjoying looking at it. Unfortunately, they're not there now, but anyway, or at least not quite in that way. There are some in the, in the uh, biodiversity gallery, and I encourage you to go and have a look at those. Um, humans are part of the natural world. And I think deep in our hearts, we all understand that we do need a diversity of other living forms to make our life complete. And again, it's sort of knowledge and interest. Okay. The, as I've got here, the more humans are interested, the healthier you'll be. And of course, it gets you out into the environment. Critically important, I believe. So what are the other pros of collection? Okay, data collection. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hammer these too much, but knowing a population size is important because if you don't know the population size, you can't ever know for sure whether it's changed. Are there more, are there less? The work they've been doing in Germany was quite nicely described on television, I think only a week or so ago. There have been some groups, one in Germany and one in Holland, that have been collecting for 30 years, every night. And you might say, oh, that's excessive. But what it does do is it gives them some solid data on, on which to say Europe has lost 75% of its insects in biomass. They might not have lost 75% of the species, but um, there's, there are just infinitely less insects in Europe now. And of course, because birds are so, uh, um, insects are so important to birds, um, they've only got 50% of their bird species remaining in Europe. Okay. Um, and of course, collections also give you data. Where was this collected? Is it still there now? So it gives you some idea of range and movement. What's happening with the populations of butterflies? I mean, we've all got suspicions, but I couldn't give you a scientific statement about that. Okay, we need to learn more about species. You'd be amazed at how different the life cycles of butterflies are. They've all got a, a basic similarity, but they're so wildly different, okay? And the taxonomy. I mean, if you want a job for life, it's if you can get someone to pay you to do it, you just want to become an insect taxonomist because there's so much to name. 
as we as I've said here before, there are probably 30 plus thousand species of moths in Australia. 10,000 of them have been described. So there are 20,000 moth species sitting out there waiting for somebody to do some work on. But of course, we provide, we don't provide the jobs nor the money to encourage people to go and do it. The chances are. And this is happening in the world even as we're speaking. You know, species are being lost on the planet that aren't named or described. Okay, um, we talked a little bit about um, uh, the thrill of the hunt. It's good fun collecting. It's harder when you're older because you can't run as fast. You can't see as well, okay? If you're going to go collecting, do not take young children with you unless you give them the net, okay? Because they will be faster than you, their reactions will be quicker, and they will see the butterflies or moths way before you do. So there's, a, there's something you could do. Take the kids and say, here, why don't you go and have a try? But anyway, you can have some fun too, and that's what I'm hoping that you'll want to do at the end of this. Okay, and we've talked about the complexity and beauty of the creatures themselves. Oh, there we go. Who's that young man there? Yeah, he's got dark hair, it can't be me. Um, that's out near um, Mount Rescue. That's what I love about Australia. You can go there and you can see virtually no signs of humans. It's great. I mean, there's a track there, so you probably get some idea that humans have plodded up and down. But a lovely place. Get out. Go and see it. A few more, few more pros, I think. Hold on. I think we've got a bit excited here. Uh, sorry for those of you. Ah, perhaps I haven't. Okay. That's the cons there. And there are a few cons. Okay. Collection does reduce the natural population size, okay? And potentially endangers the species. <coughs> In the old days, sorry, just um, In the old days, at this point in, in the talk, I would come to you and I'd say, um, there's been no recorded cases of um, uh, loss of a species by collecting. I don't think I can say that in I, I certainly don't. I certainly can't say it now couldn't happen because some, some things are down, their numbers are so low that I just have got that feeling that it is possible. And, of course, there is a repulsion, and I'm pleased there is, with regards to killing. I mean, that upsets some people. And I think that if you're going to ask something, ask something to give its life, then you've got to do the right thing by it. And so it, it behoves you, if you collect an insect, you should do something with it. Anyway. And the last thing we're seeing more and more on our planet now, rarity allows the unprincipled and destitute amongst us to act negatively. Criminals are involved in poaching. Big criminal organisations, organised crime, because that's a source of income for them. They don't care a jot about the animals and the diversity of the planet. Okay? And so I'm not saying that we're in there, we're not, and, but I'm just saying that certainly is something that might make you think, should we continue to collect? And just a few things here I want you to think about. Firstly, without doubt, habitat clearance is much more destructive. If you don't clear the habitat, you're much more likely to retain the species. And this is something that people continually say to state governments in Australia. Don't allow clearing, and you'll hold on to what you've got. Um, collection does not have to equal killing either. 
I just throw that in. Um, now, images, pictures are great. Okay, we encourage you to take pictures. The Butterflies Australia website works on us encouraging you to take pictures. Okay, but there are a few problems with electronic images. All right, one, they're not always definitive. The subtlety between some species is very small, and it's very hard to capture that on a picture unless you know what you're looking at. Um, the information, your picture, where does it go? Is it publicly available? Is it easily available? And the answer generally is no. So if I'm interested in populations or uh, ranges or distribution, you taking a picture of it doesn't help me in one way. Unless I know you've got that picture and I've got to come and harass you for it. But if there's a collection, I can go back and I can have a look at what history says. And although we might like to think that electronic images are reasonably permanent, they're not. They degrade. So what are we going to do about that if we've got all our data as images? And over time, that information is going to degrade. Okay, that's just a, a zero problem. Um, lots of collectors can lead to problems in a degraded situation. That's one of the reasons that I haven't, I mean, I've been a member of this association now for as long as it's gone. But you haven't heard me sort of stand up here and say, oh, go out there and collect. I mean, we're encouraging you now. But one of the things that worries me is the number of collectors in South Australia, okay? And I think we have to be careful. So we've, people have got to go out there with the right ideas. And the last thing before we get into something practical um, is that um, if you're going to collect, if you collect the younger stages, you're going to have less effect on the population. Okay, so that what we really want to turn you all into is egg collectors. Okay, and then you raise them at home and you decide what you want to do with your, the results of your labels. You can let it go as long as you let it go where you, where you collected it. Okay, or you can decide you'd like to keep that as a permanent memento of what you did, and it's a source of data. Okay. Oh. Um, this is just a little setup. You can record life cycles at home. Okay. Um, one of the butterflies in South Australia, uh, we were studying its egg laying behavior. And um, at two o'clock in the afternoon, this female, the guy of a subterrestrial, she would put her antennae up because she'd had them flat for the entire morning, put her antennae up, have a bit of a sniff, and she'd fly down to the base of those uh, bits of uh, wood there, and she'd lay about 90 eggs. And then, the and then when they hatched, I would take them back into the wild and reintroduce them to the ant nests from which I got them, or where they would have been, sorry, not that I got them. But everybody can do that. I mean, and I'm no Shakespeare with a camera, I can tell you. Okay, all right, let's move off collecting. You can be pro or con, but at least we can have a balanced argument. Okay, so nets, small jars, glisten paper envelopes for the adults, that's sort of what you're going to need to collect. Vials, small jars, pupil tubes, scissors for pubie. Similar for eggs, adding a scalpel might be useful. And if you want to collect, Plants, you're going to need plant pots, spades, and don't forget the water. Because once you've collected the plant, you need to water it to give it a chance. Oh, here are some people out in the... Oh, they look young too. Gee, it's not terrible. Okay. All right, nets. Okay, let's talk about nets. I said this is going to be entirely practical. All right. Um, a 
hand net. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to mention Mike Bramey's name quite a bit because I've known Mike for scores of many years. And uh, I've been lucky enough to go collecting with him a few times. And he's almost um, the best collector I know. Certainly better than me. Okay. And he always carries a hand net around him. He doesn't use it, but he carries it. A spring net, you know. So if there's something that it's appropriate, he just unsprings it. He's got a net and he can collect with his hand net. Normal nets. I consider this a normal net, about $150. Not cheap anymore. Marion didn't pay that when she got it 50 years ago, I can tell you. But it um, uh, comes in a number of parts. Your handle, you've got the hoop. There is a, normally an, a bolt and screw a nut there, which you can tie it on. And the bag. You can get the bag in different colours. Uh, people seem to think that black is the best one, black or dark green. I always used to collect with a white one, and I never felt that there was much difference. So, but anyway, about $150 a pound. Canopy nets. Um, uh, when I went a couple of years ago on this, uh, on this Queensland trip, I was quite shocked. Mike brought along three or four canopy nets. Now, a can canopy net is, um, they're generally made in, the best ones come from Japan and South Korea. Okay, they really love butterfly and butterfly collecting in those countries, by the way, particularly Japan. Um, but a canopy net is um, probably not this long. No, no, it might be, but it's got 10 or 12 sections in it which can be pulled out and twisted around. So that, as you can see, 12 times this, you're going to have a net 12 to 15 metres long. So you can catch butterflies off the canopies of the trees. And, in, and if you're going to go into Queensland, rainforest situations, you're going to need a canopy net if you're going to, if you're going to collect everything you might wish to. They're about $500. Okay. Uh, <coughs> fortunately, in South Australia and Western Australia, you really only need a normal net, okay? You might have to leap occasionally, okay? But generally, you can get by with the normal net. Now, pupil tubes. I think I'll show you those later. Um, you're going to need, in your box of tricks, you're going to need pupil tubes and scissors. I always carry a pair of scissors around in my pocket because you'd be amazed how useful they are. And for eggs, you, depending on, the, on your eyesight, you're either going to need hand lenses or maybe not, but a scalpel and scissors will be handy. We'll talk more about that in a moment. There's a technique to netting, you know. Do you chase the butterfly or do you let it settle? Do you walk quickly after it? hoping it'll settle? Or do you run after it and sweep madly? It's a real decision you've got to make. <laughs> you, might, you might think it's, uh, it's, yeah, anyway, come to that in a moment. Um, do you sweep when the insect's flying away till it settles? Okay. Do you sweep horizontally? Or third? <coughs> Another drink. They've got amazing, they're amazingly agile and they've got excellent vision. And there are times when I have been amazed I have missed the butterfly. And of course, it's the only one of that species in the area. And it's different unexpected, rare. So they're important decisions. Do I come down vertically on it 
And of course, you know, in your passion with all these hormones flooding through your body, you know, you whack the net down and you probably <coughs> feel a little break, you know, hard to break. But, um, you know, and if this is a prickly bush, you, know, you get your net tangled. It's all, all these things have happened. Or do you try to sweep uh, horizontal, horizontal? Now, interestingly, butterflies usually fly up. So if you're going to sweep horizontally, try to think the butter, you're going to catch the butterfly there so that as it rises, you might get it in the middle of the net doesn't really matter where you get it, but I'm just saying they do go up. That's why coming down can be a tremendously good idea. Okay. Right. Now, because they always fly up, when you have netted the object of your desires, okay, it's an idea to, well, almost essential to come and hold the top of the net up. And what's going to happen is that the the, the butterfly or moth indeed, will fly to the top, which allows you then to cage it in the top of the net. Okay? Now you've got uh, a couple of decisions to make, or at least a couple of techniques to consider. I always started, because I, I didn't have too many problems with collecting and I always felt that we were lucky in Australia because the populations of things were relatively large and all those things. Anyway, I always used to be a collector. And one of the things that you can do, so your, your, your butterfly is fluttering around there. So it tries to immobilise it, otherwise it can damage its wings. And you can give it a thoracic squeeze. So it sits there with its wings at the back and you come down on top of it and squeeze its thorax from the sides. And basically what you're doing is you're pushing all the air out of it. Okay? And so um, it finds that a bit difficult. And um, smaller butterflies can actually be dispatched just with a thoracic squeeze. The larger ones are a lot more resilient. Okay? Now, so the thoracic squeeze is quite a good, good technique. Okay, so if the thing's dead or fairly comatose, you can then skillfully, of course, get your bottle. You can see the planning is important. Okay, can I do the lid? And you can put it up in here and work it up. This is, it's all just practice. And then you've got it tightly over the top there. So you keep the net over the top so it can't get out. And of course, you're going to be on the ground now normally. And then you can bring the thing up if it might be fluttering around and you've got your lid on. So you've, you've, you've got your capture, okay? Now, there are some problems with leaping to the thoracic squeeze instantly. And that is that it's very hard through this net to see the space of the butterfly. Okay. And so you can feel as though if you get a perfect specimen, everything's turned out right. But what if it's got a big chip out of its wing? Interesting questions, isn't it? So I've always, as I say, I've always been impressed with. Mike Bravey, and so I'm going to give you the Mike Bravey technique. Oh, sorry, let me just finish this. Um, you can bring the jar up and capture it alive, of course. You don't need to do the thoracic squeeze. If you want to take a picture of this or you want to use it for breeding, keep it alive. There's an X mark on the floor here. <laughs> um, uh, so you can capture it alive if you want to, okay? Or if you don't trust the thoracic squeeze, you can use a killing jar. Now, I'll just explain this killing jar. We are coming back to my baby in a moment, so don't worry. Now, this jar has got some plaster of Paris in the bottom, 
simple plaster of Paris that you can buy quite cheaply. It's a relatively normal jar. I mean, I've used Vegemite jars for years. Um, and what you are going to then put in here is um, most people use ethyl acetate. So I'll just get some ethyl acetate. Okay. Now, ethyl acetate, or certainly in sufficient concentration, is present in nail polish remover. So if you want to go and buy a nail polish remover and put nail polish remover in here, feel free. This is highly concentrated ethyl acetate, which you can purchase. You can actually get it from your local pharmacist. It's just they'll have to get it in for you. But there are some chemical supply companies. I bought this one down Prospect Row. They're very nice. They were. Rang them up in the morning. They said, yes, we've got some. Come and get it. So I did. Not wildly expensive. And what you do, of course, I will demonstrate, seeing that this is a demonstration, is simply pour some of this. Just remember that ethyl acetate is poisonous. So don't go drinking or anything. Now, this wouldn't be enough. I'd put more in here. But what happens is, of course, is the ethyl acetate um, percolates into the plaster of Paris, and you've got a jar there which will um, dispatch uh, your, your uh, specimens. You do need to do one thing before you put anything in there, though. You've got to use this most important of material. Okay, this is almost the most important thing you can carry. Okay. Um, and... Toilet paper. Um, you don't want to get the specimen wet. So it's always a good idea simply to put something like that in there, okay? So that you avoid getting the specimen wet. I actually even cut, cut it to size originally, all right? So that's a, that's a killing jar, okay? In the old days, they used to use a potassium cyanide in there. Uh, but I understand that's hard to get hold of now. <laughs> the old guys love cyanide. They'd love still to be able to use it. I think, Peter, you might be able to help me here. I've never used potassium cyanide, but I understand it's the one killing jar that you can prepare that doesn't have liquid floating in it. Okay, is that right? What's the downside? You leave your specimens in ethyl acetate too, it will dry them out. We'll talk about drying out a little bit later on. Okay, um, Mike Raby. Uh, now, Mike, where are you? No, oh, here we go. Mike's technique's excellent. He goes, he goes um, into the field uh, with. Yes, I'm coming back. Um, I haven't quite got the right um, um, tweezers, but he carries a flat, no, a flat nosed pair of tweezers. The Zoom people can't see what you're doing. You can either turn the screen oh, off with me. share. Oh, yes, I'll try. Yeah, turn the screen off share so that you can then talk to the things you're doing and then screen that thing. Okay, if you show me how to do that. Yeah, sure. So if you've got some demos to... Yeah. Okay. So Mike goes with, um, you know, an old tin. I think this is a sweet tin, but, you know, if you've got a father or grandfather who smoked pipe tobacco, that's for you too. And what he's got inside is um, uh, these things called... They're made out of something called glycine paper. Okay. And this is an envelope. And um, as you see, it's got a little envelope thing there. And what Mike does, he, and of course he's highly practiced. I must admit I've never sat down and actually done that because you sort of get into habits. But he's got his specimen here, okay? And what he does is he puts his, can, oh, right, okay. He puts his hand up in here 
and actually grasps the, the insect underneath here. Remember, it's still alive, okay? Um, he might use the tweezers to do it, okay? So he puts his tweezers up here, gets the insect, uh, which he retains in the tweezers. I wish he was here to do it. And then puts it into the envelope. Now, it's not dead, but because it's severely restricted, it, it, it won't damage itself. And the glycine paper doesn't take any of the scales off, right, or few. He might, um, and then he puts it back into his, into his box and he just piles his specimens one on the other and then sticks it back in his pocket here with his tweezers and so he's not encumbered at all with anything. He's just wonderful. And, I mean, that's a technique that you can practice. But you will need flat-nosed um, tweezers, okay? Otherwise, you're going to wreck your net or jab the specimen or, or whatever. But it's a very, very good technique. Keep going. Oh, right. Okay. All right. So that's the Mike Gravy technique, and that's what I would use. Can I have my... Sure. Okay. <clears throat> it's just I need this just to sort of keep a bit on course. Mm. We've only got another hour and a half to go, so don't <laughs> worry. Okay. Okay. So we've talked about removing the insect. Um, tweezers and envelopes. Okay, we've talked a little bit about killing the specimen. The best way, and probably in some ways, well, certainly it's relatively humane, is to freeze it. Okay? Um, freeze it because they're cold-blooded. They just slow down, have a bit of a nod off and don't wake up, okay? So um, that, if you've got a car freezer, excellent, okay? It's a bit hard to lug a freezer around with you in the field. So you really do need some way of, of, of keeping the specimen. I tend to walk around. I might have two butterflies, two dead butterflies in a jar, so I need to carry three or four jars in, in my bag. Um, uh, yeah, so that's how I do it. It's very, very simple. But there are better techniques which allow you to check the specimen, e.g. the mic, Raby, let me have a look at it. And um, the idea of uh, um, keeping the specimen nice and neat, not it doesn't smash against anything else on these scales. There are problems with capturing it because you can do that and then kill it, okay? And they are the specimen damages itself or others. Um, keep your specimens in the dark and that'll stop them getting excited. If it's light, they want to fly towards it. So um, specimens into the bag, zip the bag up. Keep it under a tree. Don't let them get too hot. Because if it gets very hot, if you leave it out in the open, then they can expire and you don't want them. Okay? So there are a few things to consider. Okay, field storage. Uh, okay, um, you've gone out, you're going to collect some material. Um, what are you going to do? Okay. Um, if it's a short trip, Jars and envelopes will probably do. If it's a longer one, you have to decide whether you're collecting live material or dead material. Live material takes a lot of space. Okay. Um, I think I'll leave it at that because what you're going to need is you're going to need large boxes for caterpillars and adults um, and for food and all those other sorts of things. Okay, if they're sacrificed, you can field pin them. So what's that? So you've got your dead specimen. What you do now 
is you put an insect pin through it. Now, let me talk about insect pins just for a moment. Yeah. Okay. Now, an insect pin, insect pins come in various sizes, and you will need these if you're going to have a collection. These are stainless steel pins, okay, or at least rust resistant. Um, Dressmaking pins aren't good enough. Dressmaking pins have got a lot of nickel and copper in them. And what happens over time is that the, the dressmaking pin reacts with the fluids in the specimen, produces copper carbonate or nickel carbonate, which of course is green, um, uh, and stains the specimen. Uh, and the pins themselves can become quite brittle. Okay. So Use a proper insect pin, okay? Again, easily obtainable from Australian entomological supplies, as are the nets, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Okay, so field pinning. Simply put a, 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 a pin through the specimen. Um, don't worry about thinking about setting, although that is a possibility which we're coming to. Now, you can use any box as a storage box. Okay, I'll just show you what I've got here. This is one of the first things I ever made. This is my first, one of my first pinning boxes. And you'll see that all I've got is highly dense polystyrene. Cut a few grooves. That works as a as a setting tool. Okay. Now, why do I like this? Oh, here's my support. Again, polystyrene. I can remember we got this from Ascot Disposals when it was there a million years ago. But as you can see, that provides a nice firm base for me to do any pinning. But it's got another, it's got another advantage in that the other side I leave like that. So I can now put it in there and I can take my pin specimen and just shove it in there like that. So in here, I might get, depending on the size of the specimen, of course, um, uh, 50 or 60 specimens that I can deal with when I return home. Right? And if you get your sizes right, um, you can see them. The problem with a box like this is that it's uh, uh, it, air can get in and out easily. So that the specimens in there are going to dry out. Now, that's not necessarily a problem. It just adds a little bit more uh, complexity later on. Wooden boxes generally are much better made, the storage boxes. Um, and if I was going, I would take one or two of them, depending how many specimens you thought you were going to collect. And I've got some stuff in there, so I want to be a little careful. Um, but uh, you are going to keep your specimens a little bit more moist in somewhere like that. And of course, they're perhaps a little bit more physically protected too. All right. So that's field pinning. What else can you do? Well, you can paper the specimen. Now this time, uh, you can uh, use um, one of the um, uh, glycine envelopes. There are plenty of those. They're a bit more expensive. Or you can do something like this. Okay. Um, it's slightly better off square. So I just I do have square of paper here, and you'll notice that I'm just making a triangle. I wouldn't use paper this large, but this is um, in the field. But this is more more for a, a um, example. 
fold up one of the sides there. You can even fold it over the bottom if you like. Fold down here. Okay, so now you've got a paper triangle. And you then open it up. Put your specimen in here. Fold it back up. You don't need any glue or anything if you have done this reasonably well. Okay, and you've got your specimen in there, just a piece of paper. Um, it's best if you can get glycine paper, but for some reason we haven't been able to get it in Australia for years. I mean, they, they, the envelopes you can get, but you can't just get normal glycine paper. So you can use paper triangle. This will last certainly longer than you will, all right? Um, we've got about 10,000 specimens from um, uh, Tyndale. Tyndale did a lot of collecting in the United States and brought them back, and we've got 10,000 paper specimens in the museum of his from the, you know, that he collected in the 50s or 60s. Um, the problem is you need somebody then to go and pin them. So that's a problem. They will dry out like this, but they'll last a long, long time. Okay. okay, how else can I store stuff? You can put it in the refrigerator. Now, there are problems with putting it in the refrigerator, and we're going to talk about that almost instantly, but you can put it in a fridge. It'll slow down. Should be fine. Okay. Um, or you could freeze it. So there you've got different storage methods for storing your material uh, on a trip. <coughs> okay, let me just get back my. Jeez, is that it? Do I double click it? I do. Okay, I need to move on. Can we get rid of me? Yep. Good. There's a true data collect speaking, okay. <laughs> um, that is one of the advantages of using paper envelopes, okay, is that you will want, of course, to put the location of the collection. And these days, the expectation is that you use lats and longs, okay? Um, uh, perhaps write down the closest town, okay? So you need uh, where it was collected, <coughs> the date of collection, and the collector, all right? So that's very, that really is critically important. A specimen without data is useless. Okay. Fortunately, there are too many of those floating around. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. The specimen can come out of here. Um, okay. And, and the, um, but there's an advantage in having paper, but data is critically important. And although I remembered I was going to say that, I didn't. Um, Gary, I need you to move on. Um, um, okay. What I'm going to talk about now is mould and fungus. We are approaching near the end, by the way. So I know you'll be pleased about that. Good. Now, under all that uh, banner at the top there is mould and fungus. Stopping mould and fungus is critically important because it can ruin the specimen. And anything that is moist 
will over the long time get a fungal growth on it, okay? That even happens in the So anything that's fleshy, right, and there are lots of fleshy moths and butterflies, will get fungus. So that what you've got to do is to stop uh, the, the fungus growing. And you're going to do that with another chemical that you can buy at, uh, at the chemist. And I actually bought this bottle four years ago that I like to remember, but it's chlorocresol. Very simple. It is poisonous, as most things are in the world. But um, it's excellent at stopping the, the growth of fungi. Okay, so you've got, let's say that you've, got a field, you've field pinned your specimens. Now, some people actually like to keep a few um, uh, wet bits of paper or cotton, cotton wool balls in there, okay, to keep them moist. The moister you keep them, the easier it is to pin them when you get home, okay? But what they do is in the middle of those cotton wool balls or in the paper, they'll just put a few grains of chlorocresol so that the, the air is actually a humidity of water vapour and chlorocresol vapours, which will stop the fungus growing. Okay. Um, uh, you can use it for papered specimens as well if you want to keep them a bit moist. Okay. And if you have to, and we're not going to talk about this, but if your specimen dries out, then you're going to have to rehydrate it. Now, these specimens that I talked about that were Tyndale's from 40 years ago, 50 years ago, um, they can be pinned. They need to be put into a rehydrating chamber and then they can be set. It's not quite that simple, but... And it needs a bit of work, a bit of experience, but it can be done. Okay, so it is possible to set hundred-year-old specimens if you want to. And um, what you do is you make sure that those specimens are in an atmosphere of chlorocresol and water. Um, if you, like I did on my very first trip away to Queensland, if you put your paper specimens, I was papering everything then. Um, uh, in a moist, in a tin, you can make it a bit moist, um, be aware that they might go slightly rusty, your specimens, okay? Um, for some reason, all of those specimens went slightly yellowy orangey, which is a real shame because I had some stuff that I've never collected again since. So I wouldn't use tins. I'd use cardboard or plastic or wood. Oh, oof, knackered. Right, okay, just hold on a sec. I'll... All right, Let, we'll whip through this. All right, now we let's get to the actual collecting of things for rearing at home, okay? Pupae and caterpillars need to be carefully handled. Indeed, avoid it if you can, okay? I mean, human fingers are just... They're just the wrong things. They're, they're just not su supple enough or small enough to pick up caterpillars. I would don't don't go there, okay? Because um, you'll kill them. Same with pupae. Right? You're far better to work out other ways. Um, collect the material on which the pupae or larvae are resting. I'll show you what to do with hesperids in a moment. Hesperids are skippers. Cut off the shelter, peel away the leaves, and then I finally chop them up um, longitudinally and place the caterpillar and the cut up leaves in a jar. And then you can take them home to put on a plant. Um, think about the safety of your specimens. Put them in a way where they won't clatter around in the bottle. Okay? Right. So, um, now let's just talk about Hesperids. I've got an image there of a Hesperid shelter. 
Now that shelter might contain a caterpillar or a pupae. You can see that by looking in the end, usually. Okay, if it's, if it's brown or black, it's a, it's a pupae. If, it's, um, if you see a shining black head, then it's a caterpillar. But what you do to collect whatever's in there is cut the leaves at the top so you've got the shelter in your hand, right, loosely. Then you've got to peel those long leaves off, okay? Now, if you don't do that, what happens is they dry out and they crush what's inside. That could be the caterpillar or the pupae, or the pupae. So you don't want to do that, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I've just got to find my pupil thing. Okay, now, if you're collecting pupae, I suggest that you make yourself some pupil shelters. I'll show you what a pupil shelter is like. It is simply, and I use a pencil for this, Simply a piece of paper wrapped around the pencil, screwed up at the end, hence you've got a cylinder, and put a little piece of cotton wool in the bottom of it, okay? And so that when you've got your pupae exposed, you can slot without touching it, you can slide the pupae in here and it will fall in here and it will feel really happy. It really will. It will sit there for as long as it takes to hatch, okay? The caterpillars, we'll talk about in a moment, but temporarily, remember, you've cut the leaves up very finely, longitudinally, and you've got them in a jar, all right? All right, now, right. yes? When, when you put the uh, tail first, nice question. Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was you put it in head first or tail first, which is an excellent question. Um, I didn't explain it well enough. Um, goes in tail first because it's going to come out of the head end when it hatches. Okay. And the piece of cotton wool in there is so that it can get its little forked tail um, firmly established and, and feel quite secure in there. Okay. All right. Collecting eggs. Um, as I've said before, it's probably one of the best ways to collect um, specimens because you're making such a small imprint on the adults because most of them will be eaten. Most of the eggs or the young caterpillars will be eaten. Very, very few, if any, will get through to the adult stage. If you go from egg to adult, you can observe the entire life cycle, which has got some big advantages. Um, and just remember, if there are adults flying around, there are, all, there are almost certainly eggs. So you've just got to find. Take the substrate that the eggs are on. Now, you'll notice that I've got two pictures there. The top one, um, I would use a scalpel, and I did use a scalpel, to get behind those, those top eggs and peel them away and then collect them, okay? The bottom ones, just take the leaf, okay? Take the substrate. What are the top ones attached to? Sorry? What are the top ones attached to? Uh, to? To bark. They're at the base of the plant, okay? They are Agaira satani eggs, and um, so the, cat, the butterflies lay them at the base of the plant next to the anthers, okay? And so you... Just get a scalpel, you'll need a scalpel, and just cut a thin piece of bark from underneath. All right, now, um, so we've talked about collecting pupae, caterpillars and eggs, we're in the home straight. Um, raising them at home, all right? Now, eggs, uh, use a small, wide mouth, jar. Okay, so what you're going to have to do, now again, 
and I would do this. I'm, I'm just going to plunge this in because I want it's important that you get the idea. You basically need paper in these things all the time, and I'll explain why in a moment. Okay. Um, I would cut this to fit. All right. Paper there. Put your eggs in the in the bottom there. See, it's short and wide. Excellent jar. Can't get them anymore, of course, but they're excellent. Um, and I would put beside it some fresh young leaves of the host plant. Very important. Okay. Uh, young leaves because there'll be less toxins in them. So the young will like them more. You need to be very assiduous about having fresh material in with your eggs, okay? You can't leave it a week. You've got to change it every one or two days because when the eggs hatch, the caterpillars are going to be looking for fresh material straight away, okay? All right. Um, now, larvae, you're going to need a, depending how you want to do it, you're either going to need a host plant or you're going to need cut material. It's best if you've got your host plant already established. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, this will be absolutely necessary for skippers. Skippers won't go through in a jar with cut leaves. Okay. They'll go a little way and then they'll just um, uh, perform poorly and die. So you're going to need a host plant. Now, if I was living in Adelaide, seeing that most of them will probably live on Garnia seabarana, I would get some Garnia seabarana and have two or three plants go. Okay? Have them established before you go to collect the pupae, uh, the larvae. Okay? Okay, and there are some people there in the Grampians looking at plants for um, larvae. Okay, um, frustratingly, some Hesperids also like to leave the host plant in between feeds. I'm just telling you to be prepared. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Other butterfly families can be raised in a coffee jar, happily feeding on cut host plant. Okay. Um, and I've described that technique and it's on the BCSA website. So I'm not going to say any more. I probably will. If you use a sticky sap thing like milkweed, um, you're going to need water to put your plant in. You can't just stick it in the jar as you might dry material because the sap will get everywhere. The caterpillars will get into it and die. You're also going to need, as I've got there, you're going to need a cover for the water to stop the caterpillars falling in. Okay, now I am, this is something about John Wilson under here, but you can't see it. Um, um, I, um, we're going to talk about John's um, thing here now. Okay, and I would recommend that you perhaps move in this direction. Um, <laughs> Probably straight away. Um, bring it over, bring it over yeah. Um, okay, I'll just say a few things, John, and let you do this, okay? Um, uh, these sort of self contained things, um, John's done a fantastic job here, as you can see. I mean, you know, this is almost a work of art, but you can do a similar thing with, say, um, polystyrene boxes which are becoming a lot more obvious now, when um, or more available. I mean, when I started, the only thing that came with polystyrene boxes were fish, you know, tropical fish. So you used to go to tropical fish stores and cut a, cut a piece out in front, etc. cetera. But um, the advantage of having these self-contained units is, is multiple, okay? Um, you can use a live planting for your caterpillars. You contain the larvae, okay? I'll just tell a brief story here. For years and years and years, I wanted to raise a skipper called Motosinga trimaculata, which is a very common skipper, particularly down south. 
And it feeds on um, uh, Lepidosperma carfoides, okay? Um, and, um, you know, you'd find the eggs, you'd bring them back, you'd have the plants, they'd hatch, they'd start, they'd make a little shelter, oh, everything's all right. And then after about 10 days, they'd wander away. And I could never find them. And that happened time after time after time because they're just one of these that wander away in between feeds. In the wild, they'd go and hide in the leaf or something and then come back at night and feed. And the advantage of this is it retains the, the, the larvae. Um, they allow you to use larger amounts of plant material uh, when using water and jars. And you can increase the number of caterpillars you can have in here. Okay, because caterpillars, some caterpillars will eat each other. If you crowd them in a jar, you could have some problems. And I've got here, they look neater and use up less room. So it's probably more acceptable to your partner. And if you keep them outside, of course, you, you keep the, uh, the species at a more ecological um, uh, rate, regime, okay? I'm now going to just ask John to just speak briefly about this and a few other things, and then we'll finish, okay? Okay, now uh, this box, many of you may have seen it at various plant shows and so on. Um, it's a box from Bunnings, um, and it has a door that can be, the, the hinges and can be taken off. And so what I did was cut out the a panel in the back and a panel in the front and stuck some uh, fly screen over it and uh, stiffened up the, the door with some uh, aluminium uh, molding. So what, uh, as, as Mike said, uh, this gives a very neat uh, way of carting these things around. And you can put, as Mike says, put a big amount of plant in there. And typically what, what I raise in this are monarchs and admirals. Admirals uh, feed on stinging nettles. Uh, so with a bunch of stinging nettles in there, I can raise the, uh, the, the admirals through from small caterpillars to pupae to butterflies. In addition to uh, taking these things to uh, shows, what actually happens is that they can go to schools. And, uh, and what, I, what I'd suggest is, is you people have a look at what I've got here and you can actually set it up for your kids and your grandkids and they can have a ball of a time. Um, Mike mentioned that uh, you can put decent sized branches of, uh, of your food plant in water. And what I've done here is uh, this ubiquitous type of jar with some holes drilled in the top. And over the top of that, I have placed some ubiquitous toilet paper held on with a rubber band. And the reason for that is to stop the caterpillars crawling down through any space and drowning themselves in the water. So what, they, what they'll do um, is the caterpillars will Feed and feed and feed, and crap and crap and crap. So paper down here to collect the crap. And then when they're ready to be paid, what they'll do is climb up the plant or up the plant, up, up the box onto the lid. And uh, then they'll, they'll stay there and emerge. Uh, so it takes roughly about a month during the warmer months to go from eggs to butterflies, in, in the case of a monarch. Um, so that's that particular thing. Now, the problem with this is, is that it's pretty bulky uh, and, and hard to cart around. So what, um, what I've also got here is a smaller version. The difficulty with the big one is that, is that those particular crates are no longer available at Bunnings. And in any case, the whole setup cost about $50 or $60. But what we've got here is a small version of it. Uh, and this costs all up six or seven dollars. And um, Jerry actually took this to a, a class last Tuesday or Wednesday uh, with some caterpillars in it. And now what you can see is that up on the lid there, 
And you see that there's a, a chrysalis which, uh, which was pupated on Wednesday. Um, Wednesday? Sorry, over the, week, over the weekend it pupated. And uh, so there we are. And there's a couple more caterpillars that have climbed. Have a look at it when you've finished. You may not be able to see it there. A couple of caterpillars have climbed up onto the roof and are about ready to pupate. Um, with this, what I've done is place some paper at the bottom, again, to make it easier to clean. And here I, I've simply put the twigs of, uh, of plant sitting on that and the, any sap from the uh, plants soaks into that paper. So they get in there and eat, eat themselves crazy. Um, What's actually happened here on the way over, unfortunately, one of the, uh, and that, there, was, there was another chrysalis, but it got bumped off in the, in the traffic. But what I'll do to fix that is get a thread of cotton, twist it around a cremaster, that's the stem of the, stem of the chrysalis, and then tape that to the lid of the box. So that, that uh, chrysalis is still, still a goer. Okay, now Mike was actually talking about um, I'd, I'd say it was the hunter-gatherer hunter sort of approach. What, I've, what I do is more the farmer sort of approach. That big box has at times as many as 50 uh, small caterpillars and chrysalises in it. I actually put the uh, eggs into a small kitchen container with a bit of paper on the bottom, which I moisten, then cut off the, the twig of the plant milkweed or whatever, sit that in there. So each one of these little twigs in here has a, has a monarch uh, egg on it. Uh, they'll, they'll emerge. When they, when they get to be about eight or 10 millimetres long, I transfer them into the, into the big box. In a way, that's, that's helpful because out in, the, out in the open, those small eight to 10 millimetre long caterpillars get eaten by wasps by uh, paper wasps. Mm -hmm. So this is there for you to have a look at, um, but really I'd urge you to have a look at this stuff, have a go at it, and your kids and grandkids will, will be wrapped in it. But you do need to have, as Mike said, you do need to have the food plant for them. And what I've got over here um, is, is a few seedlings that I've raised, uh, which, which people are welcome to. Uh, these can be planted out in a, in a sunny spot, and uh, there you are, you've got your food. Any questions? Um, perhaps we'll, uh, I've only got uh, one page to go, and so John will take questions at the end. Okay, okay. Yep. that's all right. Now, let me. Thanks, John, very much. Um, I've always been impressed. There. Sorry. Um, yeah, we can see the finish line. Okay. Ah. Sorry. Sorry, Jerry, if you can. No. Okay. Um, the last thing I really want to talk about are collecting plants, okay? So um, if you're going to collect plants, please don't take them out of a national park, okay? That is illegal, all right? So don't say, oh, I got these caterpillars in the national park. We them. Um, <laughs> make sure you don't take the plants out of a national park, of course. One good way to get plants, of course, is to buy them in a nursery. And with Garnia seabarana, which is very, very difficult to, um, to uh, um, uh, germinate and grow, um, you're far better to get it out of the nursery, okay? <coughs> All right? So um, let's now what we'll do is we'll move on from there and we'll just talk about the plants here. Um, Make sure you take a large enough pot plant, of course, and a shovel and a spade and some water if you're going to take plants out of the environment. 
Um, the good thing about that is that over a number of years, you'll actually build up quite a good selection of potted plants um, that you can raise a variety of caterpillars on. And um, the last thing I want to say about plants is if you take cut material, okay, out of the environment, which is fine because that's the way that I do it most of the time, what I do is to cut the material up, place it into a plastic bag, and then wrap the plastic bag up really tightly, okay, very tightly, and roll some plastic bands around it to keep it tight, and then place it in the freezer. And that will last months in the fridge quite, quite well. Okay, won't get fungally or anything like that. Okay, the important thing is to keep the, the amount of air uh, down in it. Now, you can buy hormone treated bags, which, uh, as you can see, are self destructing. Um, you can buy hormone treating bags, which will um, actually keep the material going longer in the fridge. Okay. Okay, I think what I'll do is we'll go to the last slide, which is um, good luck. And um, I'd like to say, that I, I know I've talked about a lot, but a, a lot of it is just experience and solving a problem when you get to it and asking people, okay? I mean, if you start next year raising a few things, um, there are people around that can help you. Okay, so I'll just say thank you. Thank you for listening. And I hope it hasn't been too much for the mind and soul. So thanks, Mike. We've got a couple of questions on the Zoom. Oh, right. um, so Gil, um, Gil, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hear me all right? Yeah, you're there, Gil? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one, one idea that I always use are the old Kodak slide boxes. Um, put yeah, the yeah, papered, papered specimens, crystal of chlorocresol, and seal it up with masking tape, and they'll last for a month or more and still be settable afterwards. Um, I'll, I'll just repeat that, Gil. <clears throat> Uh, if you remember, if you're old enough to remember the old slide boxes, um, Gil's saying that that's what he uses to, to um, store specimens in the, in the field. And he just tapes. Um, do, you, do you just use neat chlorocresol, Gil? Just, just a little pinch on the end of a, 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 a wet a toothpick or something and just put a cre right. so he crystal. Right, so he wets the end of a toothpick, puts a couple of grains of chlorocresol on and drops it into the slide box. And he says that lasts for months and months and months, okay? All right. I, I find it interesting. I mean, is it easy to get hold of these still? The old film roll packets? I mean, they're ideal for pupil things. So, I mean, I've got... They may, I mean, think about that size of the nice yeah, yeah, you won't need a lid for these. Um, look, I might just take 10 seconds. Um, that's right. Um, do you want Brian to ask his question? Uh, let me just, what I do, um, let's say that you've got some Hesperid pupae in here. I mean, you could have 10 in here. I wouldn't recommend that you do, but you could have. I simply put them in here to let them hatch, by the way. And um, in one of my other jars here, I've got some tool and a rubber band. 
Um, you can't really seal the pupae up, okay, because they actually um, need to dry to, to crack open. So, okay. Um, it's amazing how small um, containers you can um, you can get things to hatch in. All right, my, my skippers will hatch in that quite happily. All right. The only problem is, and um, it's one of the slides that I missed out, is you've got to get to your hatched adult reasonably soon. Okay, otherwise it's going to bash itself to pieces. Often what I used to do was simply, if I was going out to work, was to put a tea towel over it. Okay, and then they were generally, not always, but generally quite enough. All right, if you can get build yourself a cage or something as big as John's got, that's even better. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Mike, Which Gil, one? Gil had a second question. What species, uh, sorry, um, how do you degrease specimens that should become soiled by exudates? And then we'll go to Brian. Okay. Um, um, sometimes you need to decrease uh, degrease specimens that uh, where the fat inside the body of the insect has broken down into a liquid form and it can come out and stain the wings and be quite unattractive and potentially wrecked your specimen. I just degrease them in white spirits. So you've got your pin specimen. Um, just have a, a reasonably reasonable sized container, put some white spirits in it, and just drop it in. Leave it there for a day, two days, and take it out. And um, it's a, the grease will have all gone, and the specimen is um, generally okay. Okay, um, I'd say almost certainly okay. I've actually got a friend in Western Australia who plays a, a hair dryer over, it and the scales actually will lift back up, and um, his specimens even look better still. So. Yeah, so white spirits is very good. That's what I use. Okay. You can still get white spirits. Brian. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the, the talk tonight. It's been really brilliant to, to hear, hear from, from you, Mike, and, and also John. Um, I, I was wondering, though, whether you might be able to suggest some either a, some moths or butterfly species that you feel that would be for, for novices in particular uh, that, that might um, ensure that they're successful in their, uh, you know, new endeavour? That's, that's an excellent suggestion. Um, uh, oh, sorry, the question was, can I recommend any, speci uh, any species to you that, um, whilst not being foolproof, uh, perhaps a good way to start. Um, and I'd say, yes, I can. Um, and I've sort of done it before. Um, cabbage whites are excellent. Okay. You might say, do we need more cabbage whites? But remember, <laughs> you're learning the techniques. You're, you're, you're learning the errors. Um, the, the nymphalids, um, painted ladies, um, admirals, um, and, of course, um, you know, the monarchs are good. Um, where else would I go? If you're going, if you want to try skippers, I would, um, I would uh, try Hesperilla denizer. You can get eggs of those. But you will need, a, you will need Garnia seabrana. But you can buy that in a nursery. Okay. All right. Is that enough? Well, what about moths, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not so knowledgeable with moths. I might ask Peter if Peter doesn't mind. Peter's raised many, many more moths than me. Um, I, I, although I've concentrated on butterflies, you realise, of course, that you do the same thing with moths, all right? Okay, although some of them might need dirt. Without any stimulation, you don't need to plant 
huge rate. In fact, the main chunk is to keep the food. To keep the food up. Yeah. Just for food. Yeah. yeah. Just um, food. Um, and, but they did cannibalize the stuff to keep them starving. Um, Peter's, Peter's saying uh, emperor gum moths, which apparently will lay eggs very easily um, and will feed quite voraciously. Um, I, I know Andy Lyons used to raise his in a bathtub, you know, so <laughs> you'd have lots of them and um, just have lots of room to uh, uh, for them to feed. So, yeah. Yeah. Our about eight or ten months, so <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'd just like to call on any last questions from the floor here in the room. Could you like to come up, Jen? Well, it's a decent homework and find out what, what butterflies and what plants they go to. To look at the right plants to try and find the eggs. It's, it's, it's in a field, it's where you go. You, know, you go to this plant or that plant, you can't watch it. So you do a bit of homework as to what things you might see on what plants, what they might look like, what the larvae might look like, what the, what the eggs look like. So you kind of got a feel for, for what you're looking for. Just you stick in the field because you just go, there's all this stuff, well, where do I go? Do I go to bark? Do I go on this plant, that plant? So let's concentrate on yeah. a couple of specific grass or, or something. Jan's making uh, another another good point that some research before to know the host plant of um, the, the species that you might be trying to target um, is is a good idea so that when you're out in the environment you know which parts to go to and look for eggs on, okay? And the other thing, for example, if you were, if you're in the desert and you want to even just look at and see those lovely agaras, the lovely brilliant um, uh, blue butterflies, find some mistletoe and stand there and the butterfly will come to you. I can't, I'm no good at chasing butterflies, but just stand that mistletoe <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to, uh, I'll just add to what Jan said there. And Jan was saying, you know, if you know what is going to be the focus of the butterfly's um, habits, then going there and standing there will often mean that you don't need to walk vast distances, okay? Um, I'd also say um, hilltopping is very good, okay? If you can find uh, a sandy dune, okay? Um, male butterflies tend to go to the top, so you'll be they'll be there to collect, okay? Females come up early in the morning and mate, okay? Anyway, look, I'm... Oh, okay. Right, on behalf of everybody, I'd like to say thank you. <laughs> I, Mike and I have spent quite a bit of time in the field together. In fact, I don't know, was it a month? <laughs> uh, in the Rawlinson weeks. Ranges. Yeah, and um, I learned a tremendous lot from him because I'm not, I, I'm just a general collector. And, and when you go out with someone who is a specific person that knows specific, about specific things, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And um, I thank you because even though I've done a lot of this myself, you can always learn things. And I've never have done very little rearing and all of this sort of bottles and jars and stuff. And I just found it absolutely fascinating. And um, I'm absolutely delighted that you came tonight. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of everybody. And we'd like to give you a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.